Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and a writer for adramofoutlander.com. For all things Outlander, from the Diana Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between. This is episode 93, A Fugitive Green, week three. Hello again. We have been following the adventures of Minnie and Hal. Minnie seems to be in the better position, all things stated. (laughs) She's in London doing work for her father. And as an intelligencer, intriguer, and her father is trying to get her married off to a suitable man. Hal is recovering from the death of his wife, Esme, and the baby, who may or may not be Hal's, but could be Nathaniel Twelve Trees, whom Hal killed in a duel after he found out Esme and Nathaniel had been having an affair. He found this out because Esme left letters for him to see. Hmm. She wanted him to find out. Perhaps she wanted him to be jealous, but she did not expect he would kill Nathaniel in a duel. So Hal is in the process of problems with his job future as a career soldier. He's trying to get his father's regiment back online. He has Harry Corey, his best friend and wingman, trying to help him. But he is in the process of grieving and he's angry and he's processing all these things. And he is an absolute physical and mental disaster right now. And this day we would send him to therapy, maybe put him on medication. He'd be getting some sort of treatment. He's in a bad way. We ended with chapter six in the last episode Minnie had met Mrs. Simpson, who turns out to be her aunt, Aunt Miriam Simpson, her mother's sister. And her mother's given name is Helene. But, mm, so they are on their way to see Minnie's mother. And that is where we begin in Chapter 7, Annunciation. The Annunciation is defined as an announcement made by the angel Gabriel to Mary, the mother of Jesus, that she was going to bear a son, even though she was a virgin. Her son was to be called Jesus. Let's see if we can figure out what that means in comparison to this chapter. So they're in the coach and they're on their way. And Minnie finds out her mother had been a nun. This was stunning to her. And her aunt explained that she was a sister of the Order of Divine Mercy in Paris. I tried to look them up and I found that the Divine Mercy was in the 1800s is when it was built and established. So I'm not sure if I'm simply not finding this particular order or if it came to be in the later time period. Many wants to know what the nuns looked like. In this order, do they wear black, gray, white? Ah, their habit is white with a gray veil. They're a contemplative order, but not cloistered. So Minnie wants to know what it means to be contemplative. And then she sharply says, not their vows of chastity, apparently. Minnie. Someone in a contemplative order is a person whose life is devoted primarily to prayer especially in a monastery or convent. There you go. And in that prayer and contemplation of God's mercy and his divine nature, many could feel the blood rise from her chest to her ears. And again, she's being snarky, and I understand it. She is 17 and knows nothing about her mother, and is finding all this information out the first time. So she, my mother, had an encounter with the Holy Spirit during a particularly intense prayer, did she? And then she says, wait, my father is my father, isn't he? And her aunt simply says, you are the daughter of Raphael Wadiswade, I assure you. Okay, 
This made Minnie feel better. Very few people knew her father's real name. And if this woman did, she's probably not lying to her. Imagine all the emotions of this young woman learning her mother was a nun, that she's still alive. So she wants to know what happened and where they are going. And her aunt simply says, tersely, to your mother. And explains, a book is what happened. Sounds like all of us who like the Outlander books. A book is what happened to us, and we became obsessed for a quarter of a century. (laughs) The book in question is called The Book of Hours. We will go more deeply into The Book of Hours in the next chapter, but it is a common type of medieval illuminated manuscript. It contains text, prayers, and psalms for Christian devotion. And the particular book that is in question in the story was written in an old German, and the book was in quite disrepair. And the nuns, though their chief occupation was prayer, they were also scribes and some were artists. And her mother took the name Sur Emmanuel as her new name. So the order had produced very beautiful books, things of a religious nature, of course, like Bibles and devotionals, and they sell them in order to support the community. She wants to know where her father fits in here. Hmm. Many are sure that her father hadn't dealt with them much or she would have heard of this order. However, her aunt says, whatever his defects of character, I will say the man knows how to keep a secret and he severed all connection with the order after. Okay, Minnie is getting impatient. She wants her to tell her what happened now. And here's what she says to Minnie. What happened in brief was that Raphael Wattiswade had acquired a very rare book of hours. It was made more than a century before. It was beautiful, but in poor condition. The cover could be repaired, its missing jewels replaced, but none of the illustrations had suffered, but some of the illustrations had suffered badly from the effects of time and use. And Raphael came to the abbess of the order, a woman he knew well in the course of business, and asked whether one of their more talented scribes might be able to restore the illustrations for a price, of course. So the usual way of things would be that the book would be taken back to the scriptorium for examination and work, but in this case, some of the pages had been completely obliterated. And Raphael had discovered several letters from the original owner talking about this acquisition and giving very detailed descriptions of the more important illustrations. Because this had been written in German in a very archaic form, no one in the order was able to translate it. So, Sir Emmanuel was allowed to travel to Raphael's workshop with a chaperone to do the work. Then her aunt says, but things happen, don't they? And the thing that happened, of course, was Minnie. Her aunt goes on to explain that her mother was 19. And Minnie tries to figure out how old her father would have been, 27 or 28 years old. Old enough to know better, indeed. So Minnie is brimming with all these emotions, and I'm sure internally she's bouncing back and forth, and her aunt is sort of this even keel giving her the information. Minnie wants to know what happened to her mother after the pregnancy was discovered. Well, they sent her away to a terrible place in Rouen, an asylum of sorts, and they treated her very badly there. And... Miriam had no idea until Raphael showed up at her house telling her they'd sent her away. So Miriam and her husband went to go get Sir Emmanuel from this terrible place and find a suitable place for her. But she was in a state of mental breakdown. She would barely speak. She was in her own world. She was in despair. And she was skin and bones when she collected her. And she didn't even know who her own sister was. 
through time and love and healing, eventually she came back, but not totally. And she stayed in her own world. I mean, so much in her own world that she lost her reason. She thought she was back in the convent going about her usual work. And then when Minnie was born, Sir Emmanuel, her mother, was unable to cope with the situation, and she reverted back to her state of blank detachment. And poor Minnie is thinking that she drove her own mother to insanity and destroyed her life. I think her mother was fragile, and she was abused in that asylum. And she was in love with Raphael Wadiswade, so this is a multiple attack upon her emotions and her mental health and her capacity. And Minnie asks if she was a product of rape. Thankfully, her aunt says, Nom de Dieu, no, no, certainly not. <laughs> Say what you will about Raphael. I'm sure he's never taken a woman who wasn't willing. Mind, he can make them willing in very short order. Then Minnie asks again exactly where they are going. Where is my mother? In her own world, ma chère. I like the distinction between her aunt being so stable and so still. Maybe a little terse, but she's an anchor in this situation. And Minnie is containing her emotions pretty well, but you can feel them like a volcano ready to explode underneath, and she's not quite sure what to do with them. Be careful what you ask for, because you might just get it. She'd been on this mission to find her mother, and now she's almost found her. Sometimes things are better left unknown, and sometimes they're worth knowing. Let's see if it's worth it to her. It was a modest farm cottage, is how it's described. There are trees, it's near a small village, and there's a large stone church in that village with a tall spire. Her aunt explains that she wanted her to be close enough to hear the bells. They don't keep the hours of praise as a Catholic abbey would, of course, but she doesn't usually realize that, and the sound gives her comfort. Minnie assures her aunt, I won't hurt her, I promise you. Her aunt had told her, Sister Emmanuel was an anchorite, or believed herself to be one, a hermitess, fixed in her own place, her only duty that of prayer. And she feels secure, she thinks. Safe. And it's not just safe from the world, it's safe from everything, from everyone. Minnie had mixed emotions of anxiety, astonishment, sorrow, and even hope. Hope of a mother's love. So what is an anchorite? Well, there's a very famous anchorite, but an anchorite is considered a religious recluse, one who is retired from the world. And the famous anchorite that many is thinking of is St. Simeon Stylites, or Stylitis, I'm not sure. Basically, as a 13-year-old shepherd from Turkey, Simeon heard a gospel reading of the Beatitudes, and it affected him. He nearly entered a monastery. He learned all the Psalms by heart and began to manifest the extraordinary spirit of self-denial that was to become a hallmark of his spirituality. Thereafter, Simeon lived as a hermit. In the year 423, he imposed himself the unusual mortification of living atop a pillar only a few feet in diameter and about 10 feet high. Later, a much taller pillar over 60 over 65 feet high was built for him. The local bishops and abbots tested his virtue by commanding him to come down from the pillar, a command they immediately rescinded after the hermit demonstrated his humble willingness to obey them. One bishop even brought him Holy Communion. Simeon devoted himself to prayer, but also gave exhortations twice daily to those who gathered around the pillar to hear him. His words won the conversion of pagans in the audience. Simeon would urge his listeners to pray for the salvation of souls, and following his mother's death, he offered particularly fervent prayers for her. As usual, the links to the 
information of interest will be in the blog post. In the book, it's also offered up that when Simeon's niece was orphaned, he generously set her up with her very own pillar. But after a few years of this life, the niece had reportedly climbed down and decamped with a man, much to the disapproval of the history's author. (laughs) I don't think I'm going to live on a pillar. Mm -mm. They get to the cottage door, and Mrs. Simpson explains to Mrs. Budger, the caretaker, that this is Miss Rennie, Minnie. She tells them that it's about tea time and the kettle's boiling already. Minnie is told that Sir Emmanuel still calls herself that. She spends her days and most of her nights in prayer. Sometimes she has visitors, people who've heard of her, who come to ask her prayers for one thing or another. She said at first she was afraid when people would visit, that they'd upset her. But she seems better when she's listened to someone. Maybe it gives her purpose somewhere inside that broken heart. Many wants to know if she ever talks to the visitors, and apparently she does sometimes. But many thinks it doesn't matter as she tries to get the food and tea down. It doesn't matter if she won't speak to me. It doesn't even matter if she can hear me. I just want to see her. The Ache of the Motherless Daughter All of her expectations, all of her wonderings and dreams and desires, will they be fulfilled or will they be bashed? Will she get even a moment of discovery of a mother's love? Let's see. Chapter 8, The Book of Hours. So her mother was in a tiny stone building with a thatch. It looked almost like a lambing shed. And she is told by her aunt that she won't have very long. It's almost time for known. What she thinks is known. When she hears the bells, she won't do anything until the prayer is done. And often she's silent afterward. And Minnie's confused. Known? The hours, she says. Hurry if you want to speak to her. Minnie goes in, and she notices what's in the room. A single large candle set in a tall iron stand. Fragrant smoke is rising from the candle. It was dim, and she could see the figure of a woman dressed in white robes, kneeling, a crude prix de, that is a kneeling prayer altar sort of furniture where you can kneel at it and then put your prayer book in front of you. This startled the woman having Minnie come in. She held out her hand. The woman rose with a slow rustling of coarse cloth. She wasn't veiled. Her hair had been roughly cropped, but had grown out a little bit. It curved just under her ears, cupping the angles of her jaw. Thick, smooth, the color of a wheat in a summer field. Mine, Minnie thought with a thump of the heart and staring into her eyes. Mine, too. And she calls her sister, Sir Emmanuel. And the woman looks Minnie up and down, intently returning to her face. And this is splendid. She turns her head and addresses a crucifix hung on the wall. Est-ce qu'une vision, Seigneur? Is this a vision, Lord? And then Minnie asks her how she is, en français. And Minnie says, I hope I see you well. And she thinks, Mother, oh, Mother, as she notices the grubbiness of her habit and food on her breast and skirt. And she notices a book on the Prix de. It was a rich one, polished ebony with mother-of-pearl edging. The corpus had been made by another truer hand, though. The body of Christ glowed in the candlelight, contorted in the grip of a knotted chunk of some dark wood rubbed smooth. His face was turned away invisible, but the thorns were carved sharp and vivid, sharp enough to prick your finger if you touch them. The outflung arms were only half freed from the wood. 
but the sense of entrapment, of unendurable agony, struck Minnie like a blow to the chest. Her mother is trapped inside of herself. She's trapped in this mental illness. Thankfully, she has prayer, I think. How many can say is, mon Dieu, and she was hoping it wouldn't be taken as an offense. After a long moment, she feels a touch upon her shoulder, and she turns around slowly. Her mother was close, close enough that Minnie could smell her, and she smelled sweet, a tang of sweat, clothes worn too long without washing, but incense perfumed her hair, the cloth of her robe, and the hand that touched her cheek. And Emmanuel asks, are you an angel or a demon? Minnie could see the lines in her face, the crow's feet, the gentle crease from nose to mouth. But it was like a blurred mirror of one she saw in her own looking glass. I'm an angel. She'd spoken in English. This caused a shock from Emmanuel. And Minnie tries to stop her, stop her mother from whatever she's doing. Then she realizes her mother is saying in a whisper, Raphael, 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 over and over. And Minnie urges her to stop strongly. Arrête, please stop. And then her mother says, Est-ce qu'il vous envoie Raphael, l'archange? Êtes-vous l'un des siens? Did he send you, Raphael the archangel? Are you his? Oh. Minnie says no one sent her. She came on her own. Je m'appelle Minerve. And she wonders if her mother knows her name. But her blankness was because the bells had started tolling. Her mother gets to her feet and goes to the Prix de. And now Minnie understands known and ours. She describes the book. It's a beautiful book. It was a devotional volume meant for rich lay people made during the last age with the psalms and prayers intended to be said during the monastic hours of worship. Mata, lo, prim, terce, sext, non, vespers, and compline. Known was the ninth hour, the prayer said, at three o'clock in the afternoon. Her mother said the prayer, and Minnie knit knelt down beside her in the straw, and she was trying to hear the Latin and understand. And she was so close to her, and just for this moment, she surrendered to the vain hope of being seen, accepted, and wrapped in her mother's love. Oh, knife to the heart. So she closed her eyes, and she tried to follow Deus and Adjutorium, Meum, Intende, Domine ad adjuvandum, me festina. O God, come to my assistance. O Lord, make haste to help me. So the recitation continued. Many could see that the book was very old, at least a hundred years, maybe even more. And then she realizes this is a book that had been sold by her father to Mother Hildegard in Paris, at Le Couvent des Anges. Hospital days old. <laughs> Minnie had delivered it herself to the good mother a year or so before. Huh. She was also finding a peace in these words, even though she didn't understand them all. And she noticed that Emmanuel grew quieter and stronger as she spoke. She stayed motionless when she finished. With an expression of the greatest tenderness on her face, it says. Oh, to have that peace. Minnie was worried she would disturb her if she got up, her knees aching from the stone floor. But she eased herself up, and Emmanuel didn't seem to notice. She tiptoed toward the door, as she saw it was already open. They were waiting for her. <laughs> but impulsively, she went back quickly to her mother, and she says, Sir Emmanuel, you are forgiven. She lifted her hands and went quickly away, the glow of the straw, a blur of light around her. Wow. 
again, 17 years old, such a presence of heart and spirit, such a presence to be able to understand the situation and to let go, to be at peace, to forgive the ache and the pain of her entire existence, wanting for a mother. Chapter 9, Well Past Midnight. And the first line of this chapter is, It was time. The time for what? We shall find out. Argus House had 14 bedrooms, not counting the servants' quarters. Hal had not been able to bring himself to sleep in any of them, not even his own. He hadn't lain there since the dawn when he'd risen from Esme's warm body and gone out in the rain to face Nathaniel. This man is not sleeping. And he says under his breath, on your bloody croquet lawn. It was after midnight, and he didn't want to wake any inquisitive servants. And he calls Nathaniel a pretentious nit. He couldn't bring himself even to open the door of Esme's chaste blue and white boudoir. Maybe her ghost might still linger in the scented air, or would the room be cold and empty? He was afraid either way. It didn't matter. He was standing at the head of the stairs. It was lit by three of the dozen sconces. The colors of half a, dirt, half a dozen turkey rugs melting into shadow. He shook his head and went downstairs. He couldn't sleep at night anyway these days, so he went out occasionally and roamed the park and roamed the dark paths of Hyde Park. Sometimes he would share a fire with some of the vagrants who camped there. More often he read in the library. When he read all night in the library, he did it until the wax from melting candles pattered onto tables and floors and Nazenby or Wetters came silently with scrapers and new candles, even though he'd ordered them to go to bed. Then he would continue to read after they brought in new candles. Tacitus, Marcus Aurelius, Cicero, Pliny, Julius Caesar. It was a losing of himself into distant battles and long dead men. It was a comfort to him, and he would fall asleep, with the dawn, he notes that somebody would come silently and cover him, whether he was on the floor or on the settee. And he'd usually wake up to find somebody with a luncheon tray and would rise with aching limbs and a foggy mind till tea time to clear again. And he says to himself, this will not do, not tonight. So he's in the process of healing, and sometimes we have to do things that are difficult in order to get better, and that's what he is doing this evening. He didn't go to the library. He pulled a note from his shirt that he'd been carrying since it had arrived at tea time. He read it over and over, and now he opened it to read again. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, is pleased to invite you to visit him to discuss your proposals regarding the recommissioning of the 46th Regiment of Foot, a project which is of deep, of the deepest interest to him. It would perhaps be most convenient for you to attend the Princess's Garden Fete at the White House on Sunday, June 21st. A formal invitation will be sent to you this week. A formal invitation will be sent you this week. Should the arrangement be agreeable to you, please reply in the usual fashion. Agreeable. This gave Hal a spark of hope, excitement. Agreeable, he says. And dangerous. The prince had lots of power and influence in military circles, but he wasn't the king, and the king and prince did not agree. The king and his heir had been estranged for several years. So, if he invited favor of the prince, he might get coldness from the king or vice versa. So it's a dangerous path to tread. 
Oh, and he can hope. He can emerge with the support of both. And this is why, right here, he's deciding to do some of this hard work toward healing and getting better. But he knew he was in no sort of shape to undertake that kind of finesse, exhausted as he was in mind and body. Hal had to recover. He couldn't stay in this state of exhaustion, lack of food, fainting, having flashbacks. He had to get better and reclaim himself and reclaim his sanity, but for lack of better words, over this situation. It wasn't about controlling it, but it was about processing what happened and being able to move forward, even though he won't be healed yet. He knew it was time. He had to stay away from his book-lined refuge, so he closes the door. He walked through the house until he came to Esme's room. And he opened the door without hesitation and went in. That is a huge step. If any of you have had a loss, experienced a serious breakup, going into those spaces, oh man, it's so difficult. There wasn't light in the room and the door was left open behind him. I love the description. A pale wash of moonlight fell over him and he went back and closed the door silently then locked it by the bolt. There was no smell of her. The room was cold. Beeswax polish and fresh linen lingered. So he goes to her dressing table in her closet and felt in the darkness till he found her perfume bottle. It was a perfume that he had made for her specially, and he dabbed a drop of her scent inside his wrist, just as he's just as he'd seen her do it a hundred times or more. And it brought her to life for an instant, complex and heady like the scent, spicy and bitter, cinnamon and myrrh, green oranges and oil of carnations. He left the bottle open. Back in the bedroom, he came to the white bed. He put back the drapes and sat down. Her whole chamber was white or blue, and it was filled with shadow. Hmm, wonder what that shadow could be, huh? Even the Bible on her nightstand was covered in white leather. Only the candlestick or the jewel box caught the light of the moon. There was no fire to hiss or crackle. It was so quiet in the room, he could only hear his own heart beating. There was only him and her. Oh. Such a gut-wrenching experience, but he has to say hello to her again to say goodbye to her properly. Hmm? And he says, Em, I'm sorry. I miss you. God, I miss you. And he allows grief to take him, totally take him, sweep him away, and he weeps for her for a long time. To be so angry and to be so sad and anguished. It's complicated. Loving somebody is complicated. And even when you're so mad at them, you can still have that raw ache of love and desperation for them as well. It wasn't always bad. It wasn't always the worst. They're not the one defining action. They're all the things. And that's what Hal is experiencing. And then he says, forgive me. Forgive him for killing Nathaniel for her and the baby dying because the shock of it likely sent her into early labor and neither of them survived. Forgive him for not being enough, which we know when people have affairs, that is not the problem. It's not the spouse. It's the cheater. Just forgive him. What do you think it means? That's really a loaded two words in this situation. And he went to sleep. First night he had slept in any room since her death. Wow. So Hal is on the road to recovery. It is going to be a while. 
but he needs to be healthy in order to do the job that he wants to do, in order to resurrect that regiment, in order to be competent and able. So kudos to Hal for doing the right hard, right and hard thing, <laughs> as I'm sitting here clapping for him and his efforts, and to Minnie to be brave and to say hello and goodbye to her mother at the same time, to honor the place her mother is in, who's not healthy, but she's alive and thriving in her own way, that Minnie will continue to be a motherless woman. Being a motherless woman, about having lost my mother at 10, oh, it grieves me so. I know too many motherless women. It is still not the most uncommon thing you will find, and it's hard. That both of them have made the right, difficult choices. They're both moving beyond those expectations, the, that grieving, the pain, and they're going to put it to use in some way or another and make it something that can even be beautiful, right? So that concludes our three chapters this week, and I look forward to the next three. And I always want to hear from you and your thoughts and comments and what you liked or didn't like about the podcast, what questions you have, what insights you have. And you can leave a voicemail at 719-425-9444. Or you can email contact at adramaboutlander.com. Or when I post the podcast, you can leave something there in comments. How do you support the podcast? Share it. Tell people about it. That's the best way. <laughs> Help me expand my listenership. And it will be shared on the website, adramaboutlander.com. It will be shared on the Facebook page, A Dram of Outlander, and group, A Dram of Outlander. And you have to ask to join that one. We just started it recently, so it's small but growing. On Twitter, it's Dram of Outlander. On Instagram, Dram of Outlander. And Tumblr, a Dram of Outlander. <laughs> Do you sense a theme here? And I usually cross-share the posts on all the different social media sites. And from Instagram, where I post lots and lots of photos that are Outlander-related, I may or may not share them across the social media sites. So please go to Instagram.com slash Dram of Outlander and follow so you can see all the postings. Come and join us for the Wednesday night Twitter chat using hashtag ADOO. It is at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. The Wednesday night chats will continue when the show comes back on on Sunday nights. I will do my best to have the podcast up by Monday evening. So it's easy to listen to prior to the Wednesday night chat. And as always, if any of you would like to come on the podcast as a co-host, please let me know. You can email me or phone into the 719-425-9444. And if you're interested in a drama of Outlander products, redbubble.com has a variety of things available with the Adram of Outlander logo and the Outlander Science Club logo. And if there are any phrases or sayings that you would like to that you would like to have on an item, please let me know. And I hope you have a blessed time in between now and the next podcast. Slanjava.